Good morning, everybody. We're delighted to have you come. I, uh, I think the weather has kept down our numbers a little bit, but we can't punish you guys for that. You got here on time, so we need to get started. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Uh, my name is John Hamry, uh, president here at CSIS. When we do you know, public events, we always begin with a little uh, safety announcement. I'm sorry we're living in a day when we have to do that. Um, uh, Andrew Hunter is going to be our responsible safety officer, which means, you know, if, if when you hear an alarm, if you hear an alarm, you're going to follow him and take his instructions. Uh, the exit is going to be right through here, and just right around the corner is the stairwell that goes down to street level. Please follow him. If, if our problem is out in the front, we're going to go back and meet across uh, in the courtyard of uh, National Geographic. If the problem is out and back, we're going to go out to the front, and we will go over to St. Matthew's. So just follow us if we have to do it. We don't think we have any problems at all, but uh, just but we need to be mindful. So thank you all for, uh, for being here. This is, uh, I think, the third or fourth in our series of seminars where we're trying to look at the, uh, the issues of that are the deep plumbing of national security that don't get the attention it deserves. Uh, this one gets a little bit more because we're looking at, at budgeting and top line forecasts. Uh, and so it gets a bit more attention. We spent some time looking at the False Claims Act and how it's warping you know, uh, a lot of the acquisition process, for example. We looked at um, the way we get, we're getting a global defense industry, but the parochialism of our security policies is, is keeping us from taking advantage of it. So we're trying to look at these deeper issues. Uh, today we're looking at the, uh, at the question of long-term budgets and uh, what can we forecast. Now in one sense, the immediate problem is resolved when, when uh, Speaker Boehner and uh, President Obama reached an agreement you know, that took us through a two-year period, so we don't have a we, we don't have a meltdown this fall or next year. We kind of have some stability for two years, and that's good. But that is not at all adequate. You know, this is a department that five-year budgets really matter. I mean, we have to make long-term predictable plans. We're making investment decisions where it really matters what the budget is going to be in five years and our capacity to to program you know with stability rather than find this instability that we confront every year when when budgets come to us we have had a long-term plan and we don't have a consensus on on the budget uh, and it's uh, it's probably one of the most difficult things that the department has to wrestle with uh, Dave Melcher was was PA and E for the Army, and he had he was right in the middle of that budgets and long term programming. So he's had on the ground experience doing that. He's was in headed up uh, Excellus, a defense corporation um, that, and of course you're then you're on the receiving end of saying, well, you know, what what are they going to release this quarter? Is it is the uncertainty going to cause them to hold back? I mean, all of that whipsawing that, that takes place. And now his role here today, he's going to be kind of our key speaker to get it started. Um, it, but he's with AIA. And so now he's really here with an industry voice about what this budget uncertainty means for the, you know, for the fourth department of the Defense Department. You know our our industrial partners, and it's a so I, I'm looking forward to this, and I want to say a special thank you to Tina Jonas. I, we've been friends for a very long time, very very long time. She's held up a lot better than I have, I would say. Uh, we worked together up on Capitol Hill for many years, and then of course she was the comptroller at DoD. And I'm Tina, thank you. I'm so so grateful that you'd be here today too. So it's a, an important discussion to have because. The, we've got certainty for two years, and then we have the ultimate uncertainty is what happens with the next election. And yet the department has to make concrete plans that are real. This isn't fake stuff, it's real. We have to know because we're making long-term commitments of resources, how many people we're gonna put through schoolhouses, you know, whether we're going to retire a platform and start building something. These are real long-term plans and we're living in a profound era of uncertainty because of this budget environment. 
So we're going to get into that today. David, thank you for leading us here. Would you all please welcome Dave Melcher with your applause. Yours, Andrew. Um, John, I really appreciate the introduction. I uh, see a lot of folks that I know in the audience here this morning, uh, some I've worked with, some I've worked for, uh, and uh, I was really tickled to be part of a panel this morning uh, that Andrew put together with uh, Tina and Todd. Uh, I think we're going to have a good dialogue, and I hope you all ask uh, a lot of questions when we have the opportunity to address them. Um, AIA, uh, as you may know, I've been there about six months uh, following the closure of the merger with Harris Corporation at the end of May, and it's been a, a six-month period filled with uh, getting to know this organization, getting to understand uh, some of the industry problems uh, beyond what were our own uh, issues a little bit better. And, of course, all, in that whole time, we've had a great relationship with CSIS. Uh, in July, Bob Durbin, who's our chief operating officer, joined John uh, on an acquisition reform panel at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And in October, John and I co-authored uh, a piece on Exim Bank, uh, talking about the importance of why we needed to offer these commercial opportunities uh, to our companies as a, as a factor in the industrial base. Uh, when, when we begin to hear about payloads being lost and uh, airline, uh, airline offers being lost as a result of not having Exim, uh, it was time to, to press on on that issue. Uh, and so uh, John was very kind to work with me on that. Today's subject is the need for forward-looking national security budgets and improved policies for defense acquisition. Uh, this is another issue in which AIA spends a lot of time uh, thinking and talking about, uh, and as does CSIS, and we have a common interest here. It should come to no surprise uh, to anyone here in the audience uh, that I'm an advocate for a concerted national investment in defense. Uh, but as somebody who worked on both budgets, as John described, in the Pentagon uh, and at OMB as a younger person while in uniform and then led a $5 billion aerospace and defense company, I'm also a budget realist, right? And I realize that some of these things, it's not just about increasing defense budgets, it's about getting a handle on the overall macroeconomic picture nationally and even uh, in, in a smaller sense within the Department of Defense. And there are times when the nation must economize or prioritize. Whether in government or private sector, good leaders know how to make tough choices uh, and how to infuse efficiencies into large-scale systems and how to drive innovation. Uh, I hope when we get to the Q&A part of this, we can talk a little bit more about what some of the industry reactions have been over the course of the last four or five years, uh, you know, investment versus share buybacks and other things like that, because I think that is a factor that's worth talking about. In recent history, we've dealt with tightened national security budgets through a number of creative means. We've privatized non-military functions, such as base housing and outsourced other support activities that are best handled by the private sector. We may need to have another iteration of that in the years as we go forward, depending on what the budget picture looks like. And by improving our defense acquisition system, I think we'll do a better job of procuring services and equipment, saving money, and most importantly, maintaining our vital technological lead over potential foes. These reforms include more use of commercial products, stronger protection of intellectual property rights, and adopting a more equitable approach to counterfeit parts policies. Yet we have to realize that the peril in our current budgetary policies, which limit our ability to respond to threats to our vital national interests, really stems around uh, the kind of cuts uh, that we've experienced over the course of the last several years. The $487 billion in national security cuts initially uh, voluntarily, uh, uh, initiated voluntarily in 2010 by Secretary Gates and the services was a thoughtful exercise in prudent budgeting, in trimming the fat, if you will. But the additional half trillion in cuts imposed by the Budget Control Act of 2011 went well beyond trimming fat. It threatened the muscle, uh, both the size and the quality of the force that we needed in order to handle the myriad of uh, challenges that we face around the world today. The world has changed in five short years. When the BCA became law, radical Islamic terrorism was not the clear and present danger to sovereign states in the Middle East and civilian populations throughout the world that it is today. Back then, Vladimir Putin had not announced his plans to spend $770 billion to modernize Russia's military. 
nor begun his campaign to seize Crimea, bully Ukraine, and intimidate the Baltic states and Poland. And when this act passed, we were still debating China's intentions, their military expansion in the South China Sea, disregard for the principle of freedom of navigation, and the growing implication of Chinese involvement in cyber attacks against the U.S. puts that debate in a more ominous context. The reality is that our nation's military has to be prepared for an array of uncertain threats that range from continued nuclear deterrence on one end of the spectrum, requiring a modernization of our strategic triad, to counterterrorism, which requires a completely different but equally challenging set of tools. When I think about the mismatch between the current strategic environment and the politically expedient budget decisions essentially locked in five years ago, with two noteworthy uh, exceptions, Ryan Murray 1.0 and the recent bipartisan two-year budget agreement, I can't help but think of the sage advice once given by Omar Bradley, the GI's general. He implored our national leaders in 1948 to steer by the stars, not by the light of each passing ship. I hope you share my belief that embracing the passing ship of indiscriminate budget austerity should be tossed aside, especially when these dramatic defense cuts do essentially nothing to improve the long-term fiscal trajectory of the nation. We require a more steadfast policy that allows us to chart our defense needs and project American power as a force for good wherever and whenever necessary. Let's begin with the immediate need for budget certainty and stability in the next two years. True, the bipartisan budget agreement, which provides two years of relief from the budget caps, was most welcome, as John described. But the agreement is not an actual appropriation. Congress could act like Lucy and pull the football away from Charlie Brown and leave us with a continuing resolution uh, containing sorely inadequate defense funding. I heard Mike McCord, the DOD comptroller, say the other day here that the department has been under a CR for one-third of the last five years. Think about that. Um, you know, in this environment, that seems almost incomprehensible, but it's true. That's totally unsatisfactory. That's why AI is pushing for a fiscal year 2016 appropriation for DOD that embraces the budget agreement and gives program project and activity line by line certainty to the priorities that our industry and our customers endorse. Looking forward, the budget caps remain in place for fiscal years 2018 through 2021. I hope the unfolding presidential campaign yields party nominees who are not wedded to the caps. I also hope that whoever becomes our 45th Commander-in-Chief will carefully examine the need to use the defense budget to recapitalize our armed forces. By that I mean we must go beyond simply modernizing, taking old platforms such as the B-52 and infusing them with recent technology, but still living with the huge costs of operating them. Rather, we must commit to using every tool we have in the manufacturing toolkit, such as composite materials, advanced electronics, 3D printing, to develop the new systems required to maintain our technological superiority. With this point in mind, if we do get the foundation of budget stability we want, that's just half the battle. We also need to see real change in the relationship between the Defense Department and industry to enable us to get the best products and services that our remarkably innovative air, space, and defense industry can give us. First and foremost, our Pentagon leaders should expand the dialogue with industry to help us sync our independent R&D plans with their program plans. In fact, AIA has offered the department leadership innovation tours of our companies to help facilitate that dialogue and showcase some of the amazing things that are being done with company R&D. Clearly a consistent roadmap that will take us from budget certainty to a greater amount of investment certainty would be most welcome. If investments in innovation are directed towards real programs, more innovation will follow. Talent will flow into the industry and everybody in the acquisition system. Most importantly, our troops will benefit. The good news is that we're starting to see the emergence of Secretary Ash Carter's and Deputy Secretary Bob Work's third offset strategy. Under this strategy, DOD wants to change the way it does business to promote innovation, steer more defense dollars to R&D, and better manufacture tools for warfighters. This strategy seeks to overcome a cumbersome Cold War era acquisition structure and harness the speed of rapid technology change. It looks to increase opportunities for innovation by reaching out to non-traditional defense suppliers and international markets. Its success depends upon concepts that emphasize technology insertion and open systems, rapid prototyping, and field greater commitment to commercial item acquisitions 
uh, and assurance of contractor data rights and intellectual property mentioned before. While this is a large order and it will be a huge internal challenge within the department to make this vision happen, there are indications that the wheel is being steered in the right direction. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the positive steps Congress took in the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act to promote dense defense acquisition improvements. Now it's up to DOD to take appropriately implementing measures. In, a, in aggregate, two-year budget deal, the third offset strategy and acquisition reform legislation creates a pathway for significantly improving budget planning and utilization. Yet I do have con some concerns going forward. First, with the amount of funds going into military personnel accounts and the operations and maintenance accounts, the resources targeted for procurement and RDT&E will be sorely limited. I believe that we must increase the share of defense spending devoted to recapitalizing key capabilities and developing new technologies. Second, the speed of the acquisition process must increase. Utilizing wartime expedience as a more permanent way of doing business is another way to look at the subject. The rapid equipping force, MRAPs, whether you liked them or didn't like them, and IED prevention were all designed to rapidly get capabilities to the troops. We should find a way to make this kind of procurement more routine. And there have been some attempts in this regard, uh, but most of them have not been successful. Third, we've got to reduce the amount of regulation and oversight that impedes progress and adds costs. Yes, we need audits, but not excessive audits, or ones that are particularly onerous for small defense firms. I can tell you this, once a Silicon Valley company gets its first audit request from DCAA demanding all their original paper copy receipts, Pentagon's outreach to the Valley may not look so enticing. Fourth, and along these same lines, we've got to get a handle on commercial pricing and see policies in place that meet the department's intent to attract more commercial business and the goals of the 2016 NDAA. Moving to a more commercial model will be a challenge to the Pentagon's bureaucracy, but will have positive implications for the budget, broadening the defense supplier base and encouraging innovation. Lastly, getting foreign military sales deals done with our allied partners much more quickly will have positive implications for the health of the industrial base and free up more funds for IR&D. Air Force Secretary Deborah Lee James addressed this topic last month at the Dubai Air Show, and I'm confident we'll see movement on this front from the Air Force and the other services. For all these issues, our industry has developed a very constructive and positive working relationship with Secretary of Defense and people like Under Secretary Frank Kendall and the service acquisition executives. In fact, we have a regular dialogue uh, about every six months, and we continue to work on issues in between then. We've worked on IR&D, we're working on some of the new cyber rules. There are a number of things that we continue to work on in a very positive and constructive way. In closing, by year's end, I'm hopeful we'll be in a better place with respect to the stability of national security funding, at least in the short term, allowing companies to do better planning in line with our nation's long-term national security interests. I know firsthand that AIA member companies want to invest. They also want to see a reasonable pathway to a return on that investment, which their shareholders will expect. This period of relative budget stability will be a useful time for trying to bridge some of the capability gaps that exist and the need to push technologies that will enable us to maintain superiority over current or potential adversaries. We must constantly be alert to the fact that while we have a great set of capabilities in the field, in many cases we're just sustaining or improving them at the margins whereas our adversaries are making a big push to invest in new technology and buy it quickly. There's no doubt that our country's fiscal challenges are real and must be addressed, but those who believe we can continue to fund defense on the cheap really ignore reality. We have to make a conscious decision to replenish our equipment, modernize our systems, and continue reforming our cumbersome defense acquisition system. When we have the right strategies, budgets, and systems in place to address our military needs, our nation and our allies will be on much firmer footing. And when we have real budget stability for both defense and non-defense discretionary, and AIA has always advocated it's not just about defense, it's about non-defense discretionary spending as well, then both our industry and our servicemen and women will benefit from increased investment and cost effectiveness that will result. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today. I know that was sort of a macroeconomic kind of picture. I'm, I'm happy to dig in deeper uh, as the time and uh, the panel will allow. Thank you.
Well, thank you, David. That was a, a great, uh, a great kind of overview of the situation that I guess confronts national security in general, and certainly as uh, an important stakeholder in the debate uh, industry. So thank you for for giving that. And now uh, we'll dig in, hopefully, a little deeper and and uh, try and get a little bit to the brass tacks. And let me just frame a little of that. As you mentioned, we were lucky to have Mike McCord here earlier in the week uh, talking about the budget deal and what it means for the Department of Defense. Today, uh, really the focus is going to be on the investment accounts. Uh, and that's of particular interest to industry. It's not the only thing of interest to industry because uh, about half of the department's spend is for services and, and those come uh, quite frequently from, from non-investment accounts. Uh, but the investment accounts are of particular interest uh, to me and to this discussion this morning uh, because the business of investment is inherently a long-term business. And Dr. Hamry uh, referenced that uh, very correctly at the start. Um, and of course, uh, the issue is that the deal that we have that is in place is not a long-term deal. And, and so the problem that we're wrestling is how do you, how do you bring these two, uh, two matters into some kind of alignment that makes sense? Uh, and, of course, you mentioned that uh, in order for industry to invest, they need to have some sense that there's going to be a, a return for that investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to me that everything that we're hearing from the department is that, that th this deal still leaves that, uh, I would say, entirely at risk. And uh, let me just, uh, I'll do my junior impression of Todd Harrison here uh, very briefly, specifically on the investment accounts. The, the president's request for the investment accounts for the FY16 budget, yet to be completed, uh, was $177 billion. That was about a $20 billion increase over FY15, which was sort of the natter of, uh, of coming down uh, the curve uh, as a result of the Budget Control Act of 2011. Um, and and what, what is interesting is even with the deal that I would characterize as probably sort of the best possible outcome in the current environment, um, there's a possibility that the FY16 investment accounts will be, will in fact be a, a peak and not a natter or not, a, not the start of another up curve. Uh, because uh, in FY17, uh, Deputy Secretary Work has mentioned that uh, the agreement is about $17 billion below uh, what the department had projected. And it seems very reasonable from all the commentary the department has made publicly and from the sequestration report that came out in 2014 to believe that a, a, a very large percentage of that will come out of the investment accounts uh, of that reduction. Uh, and likewise, if you go back to the BCA uh, cap levels in FY18, I think it's very reasonable to assume that the entire increase for FY16 of 20 billion or whatever it ends up being uh, will evaporate in an instant uh, if we return to those levels. Uh, and so that's the problem we face. Uh, this, uh, this could be a false dawn uh, for the investment accounts in defense um, if nothing further is done. And so uh, on having given that little bit of a framing, uh, I don't actually need to introduce our two panelists, partly because they uh, don't need any introduction, partly because Dr. Henry has already introduced Tina. Uh, and Todd is uh, known, famous, and notorious as the uh, best think tank defense budget analyst in town, uh, and it's a tremendous asset that we have him with us today. Uh, so let me first recognize Tina to, to give a few uh, opening comments and thoughts on her end. Thank you very much, Andrew, and it's great to be here this morning. As uh, John said, uh, he's been a longtime friend and uh, a great influence in my uh, professional uh, life uh, because of his wisdom and in navigating many of the difficult uh, budget uh, deals that we've had over the, over the decades, really. But I think what this morning uh, we are facing is something much different than even we did in during the uh, budget deals of the early 90s. Uh, the long-term picture is incredibly uh, murky, and I think uh, the strategy of the department is an important, plays an important part on how you navigate that. One, one area that David mentioned in his discussion, actually there were three areas that he mentioned, the importance of the immediate deal, the importance of acquisition, and the importance of uh, uh, Deputy Secretary's uh, uh, Defense Works 
third offset strategy, I think are going to be very important pieces on how to navigate forward. Um, I will say, and I believe I was not here for Mike's discussion the other day, but I understood that part of his uh, discussion was slowing the uh, modernization accounts. And those like Dave have worked in the programming area and the budget area. If you, if you want to preserve readiness, one of the oldest tricks in the book is to just slow the programs that you've got. But of course, in the long term, it makes it more difficult for industry to uh, discuss with their shareholders uh, planning. It makes it more expensive for the various programs. And um, so I think looking to some of the other mechanisms that we might have, including how will the Department of Defense take advantage of the acquisition reforms uh, and the authorities that have been provided to them. I mean, I think uh, depending, they, they should have an expansive view of, of those reforms. I know Christian uh, was here uh, last, what, two weeks ago, I think, uh, the staff director for the Senate Armed Services Committee and said, I, he really indicated that they should take an ex expansive view of those acquisition reforms. So I'm not sure how industry will embrace those reforms, how the department will implement them, uh, but I think that's going to be absolutely critical uh, to, to being able to drive um, uh, toward greater innovation and to be able to manage through a longer term picture that is, um, I, I'm not sure I share as pessimistic a view as Andrew said that this is, would be the height of, of um, the investment accounts or a peak for the investment accounts. But I do think that it's going to continue to be challenging and there may, you may go uh, to two-year cycles on agreements like we just did because that's what they can do. Um, but, but I do think bringing innovation in the way we think, and not just toward the technology, but how we manage and operate in the department is going to be critical to being able to get the kind of capabilities that we need in the future. Thank you, Tina. And uh, Todd, some opening comments on your end. Sure. Um, so I'll start out uh, by being a bit of a contrarian and trying to say something positive about the BCA. Um, so what can you say that's positive about the BCA? Well, first of all, budget caps aren't inherently a bad thing. They aren't necessarily bad. Um, what budget caps have done for us, one positive thing, uh, is over the past five years or so, it's given us a well-defined floor for defense. And so it's not been completely unbounded uncertainty. We have known the worst case scenario going through this. Uh, and thankfully, that's helped us, I think, avoid the absolute worst case scenario. The real uncertainty has been the difference between the president's budget request each year and the budget caps and trying to figure out and waiting for last minute deals like we just got uh, with the, uh, the BBA 2015 deal, uh, waiting for those last minute deals to figure out, okay, where within that range between the president's budget and the budget caps are we going to end up? Um, so it has bounded our uncertainty and provided a floor. The other positive thing I can say about the BCA before I get to my list of bad things uh, is it has forced us to actually get serious about reform in several areas. Now, we've not done everything we needed to do. We still have not gotten a BRAC, and I don't think we will get a BRAC anytime soon. Uh, and that's one of the key reforms that's needed. But we have actually gotten some pretty substantial uh, reforms in military compensation. Uh, we got the change to the retirement system uh, that's been moved through in this NDAA. We got some acquisition reform. We can debate on whether or not it's the reform we needed, but it has focused attention on that. Uh, and I think Congress may very well follow up with additional reforms there. And now we see Congress um, starting to look seriously at Goldwater Nichols reform and military health care reform as well. So that's something we may see uh, in this next budget cycle. Uh, so that's another good thing that has happened. Uh, and I think we can directly relate that to the budgetary pressures that have been forced by the BCA. Now, what's wrong with the BCA? Well, the most obvious thing is that you've got arbitrary budget caps that are set without regard to strategic need. That is the problem, right? These budget caps were set to meet a, a, a deficit reduction target back in 2011. And the problem is that, well, you know, that didn't meet our strategic needs at the time, that level of funding. 
uh, and our strategic needs have changed and what we need from the military has changed since then. And so what we've been forced into is this uh, cycle going from crisis to crisis, waiting to the last minute to make adjustments and have these one year and two year deals to adjust the budget caps slightly. But what we have seen is a convergence between the president's budget request and the budget caps. So the requests have come down closer to the caps over time and the budget caps through these deals have come up closer to the request. So there has been a convergence, but uh, that convergence ends now uh, in FY18 uh, because this budget deal is only for 16 and 17. In FY18, through the end of the budget caps in FY21, we're back at the original level of the caps and we still have a, a pretty significant uh, disagreement between what the Pentagon is planning for those years and what the budget caps will allow. Now, the interesting thing is when this next budget request comes out, the FY17 budget request will come out in February, uh, the FIDEP, the five-year plan that comes with that will extend through FY21, which is the end of the budget caps. What's interesting to me though is not what happens within those five years within the budget capped period. What's interesting to me and more worrisome is what happens outside the fight up. And that's where, uh, number one, we've got some serious long-term fiscal challenges, uh, nothing to do with defense, but in the overall federal budget. We've got uh, a generation of baby boomers that are retiring. This is a demographic bulge. We've known we've had it for decades. Uh, and so we know with great certainty uh, th from our demographics data that our uh, costs for Social Security and Medicare are going to be growing in the 2020s and they're going to continue growing uh, throughout that decade. And we, so we've got a lot of long-term fiscal challenges to deal with and politically uh, those are very difficult things to deal with. We were just discussing in the room uh, before this that you know if you want to bend those curves in the 2020s, you're talking about making changes to current beneficiaries or people who are just about to retire. And politically that's a very hard thing to do. Um, but within defense, we've got another big challenge. We've got a substantial modernization bow wave that we have been pushing out in front of us for years and years. And unlike an actual bow wave in front of a ship, uh, a modernization bow wave, you eventually have to do something about it. You can't just indefinitely push it in front of you. Uh, so we've got uh, parts of our inventory of equipment, you know, they're just reaching the end of life and they're not, we're not gonna be able to uh, continue upgrading them in some cases. Uh, it will cost more to upgrade them or just as much to upgrade them and refurbish them as it would to just buy new equipment. So we've gotta deal with this one way or another. Now the modernization bow wave is not evenly distributed across the services or across different types of platforms. Uh, I'm actually working on a study on this right now. I don't wanna give away too much, but if you look in detail, uh, one of the biggest contributors to this modernization bow wave is Air Force aircraft procurement plans. Uh, you know, we know the big three programs, the top priorities for the Air Force, LRSB, F-35, and the KC-46 uh, tanker. Uh, those are the big three. That alone would be a substantial uh, modernization bow wave for the Air Force to handle uh, in the 2020s because all of those programs will be at or ramping up to full rate production in the next decade. But that's not all. You've got several other major programs that are supposed to be ramping up at the same time. JSTAR's replacement, a new trainer, TX, presidential aircraft replacement, uh, the list goes on and on. And that's just within Air Force aircraft procurement. Uh, when you look at this across all the services and all the different type of platforms, uh, this is a substantial modernization bow wave that would require a substantial increase uh, in acquisition funding and a lot of this occurs just outside the fight app. So we're not even really dealing with it yet. We're not even seeing it yet. Uh, and when this happens, you know, we're gonna be out in that fog bank of even greater uncertainty because we'll be beyond the budget caps and we won't necessarily have a floor uh, and we're gonna have all of these other fiscal challenges uh, facing the country at the same time. Uh, so I started on my happy note of you know, budget caps aren't all that bad. Uh, and so I end on a very depressing note uh, that I think it might actually be worse uh, once we get beyond the budget caps. Well, thank you, Todd. And thank you for reordering the universe back to where it belonged because if anyone knows Todd and I, me being the pessimist and him being the optimist is just uh, the world was askew there. And Fortunately, he brought it home there at the end uh, to, to write the universe on its scales. 
so uh, I want to ask, uh, and I would really welcome each panelist uh, addressing this, the question of how good was the budget deal ultimately uh, for investment and for industry? And I sort of treat those two equivalently. That's a rebuttable assumption. But uh, uh, how good was this deal actually for that? And let me just sharpen the question a little bit. Uh, it gets to what Todd was talking about. And I don't want to get too much into programmatics, but one of the sort of cliffhangers that is currently on the table uh, is a question of the JSTARS replacement program. Todd, you, you referenced some of the challenges there. And of course, uh, one of the major issues that a milestone, such as the, the milestone A decision that, that's being awaited there, is supposed to look at is the question of affordability. Is it affordable? Uh, and Todd, you, you, you mentioned some reasons why that's very much in question. So, uh, so, and how do you even determine that, given the budget uncertainty that we're facing? So let me just throw that question out to the panel of how good was this, this agreement ultimately looking at it specifically in terms of investment and, and what that means for industry and its ability to plan? Um, well, I'd be happy to start. I mean, in, in general, any stability is better than no stability um, because if you think about what was it that everybody was contemplating before this budget deal was crafted, it was probably uh, a year-long CR followed by another year-long CR in an election year. Um, that would be terrible on so many fronts. Um, now, the sad part is it took the Speaker of the House resigning in order to get uh, a balanced budget agreement that allowed even, you know, this setting of the top lines, and now we still got to get, you know, an omnibus uh, spending bill through. So, you know, I, I think it was huge that, that this budget deal of two, you know, years was crafted, particularly through an election year. And I think for many of the, the companies in the industry, it provided at least enough confidence that the investment plans that they were on, you know, to develop, uh, you know, current, ongoing, or new technologies uh, should stay in place. Uh, and I don't see any uh, diminution of that, you know, from companies at least in the next couple of years. Now, looking farther ahead, you know, clearly there's an issue. But I think companies want to invest. We've come out of a period where many companies retrenched. Uh, they pulled all, the, all sorts of levers to try and economize and keep money into their R&D budgets. And, you know, there has to be a period of growth that follows, whether it's through acquisition or it's the realization of, of what happens with those investments. But I, I think it was huge just to have a two-year budget deal. And I'm hopeful we can get another two-year budget deal uh, in 2017 if that's the best we can do. Um, but this notion of going back to regular order, I mean, it really does mean something. This is what the Congress exists for, you know, to, to pass legislation, to pass appropriations bills, and to keep, you know, the nation's defense architecture and social architecture going. Um, that is something that all of us ought to demand of our legislators. Yeah, I agree. Um, huge, I guess, is probably an important uh, word right now. When it, it, because many um, companies, uh, in fact, the entire town was uh, really fixated on whether there would be another continuing resolution, uh, I think it was an important uh, way to break uh, the, the, the paradigm, break the pattern that, that had existed. You know, Mike's, uh, I guess it was earlier Mike McCord was saying that uh, he's lived under a CR for about a third of the time that he's been comptroller. That, and I, uh, certainly during my time, we had periods of, um, of uh, CRs. However, that uncertainty uh, is so, has such a deleterious effect to uh, the system as a whole that a two-year agreement, I think, I would agree with Dave's conclusion here at this point is huge. But more to the point, it shows that it can be done. It can give confidence again to the system that it can be done. It's important to be done. And it takes out, as John said, the ultimate part of the problem with the ultimate uncertainty of the outcome of an election. Uh, transition periods between administrations, no matter the party uh, affiliation, are always uh, difficult and cause, uh, can cause uh, difficulty in terms of uh, proper planning and program planning. So I, I would absolutely agree with Dave's conclusion here that this agreement was very uh, important. Uh, I can't speak specifically to his membership, but I would bet they completely agree with you that uh, uh, that it was important for their shareholders to see as well 
um, at least some defining of the defense landscape. Uh, I would just add that, that you know this is probably about the best deal we could have expected, right? It's not a perfect deal, but it's about the best we could have expected, uh, and better than many of us had expected. I would note that uh, CSIS did a, a survey on what people thought the outcome would be, and Mark Kansian, who's here today, uh, he led that effort. Uh, and if you look at the results of that, most people were thinking that we would get something uh, worse than this, a full year continuing resolution or something of that nature. Uh, so, you know, and this deal did come pretty close to what the president requested in total funding, at least for FY16. For FY17, it's not quite as good. And as the, the comptroller, Mike McCord, uh, said here on Monday, uh, some of that uh, reduction in FY17 is probably gonna come out of investment funding, of acquisition funding. So it's not a perfect deal. It's not perfect for industry, uh, but it is probably the best we could have gotten. The one thing I would add is I, I'm, my optimism is that once we get into a new administration that maybe we could get a four-year deal that goes all the way through the end of the caps uh, and take it off the table, uh, but I, I may be foolishly optimistic. Um, I'd just like to follow up a little bit on you know, this notion about a two-year budget deal is certainly a positive thing. But, you know, having lived in the program and budget world with Tina in the building and now having lived with industry for seven years before coming to this current role, you know, one of the things you learn is that when things appear to be going your way is when you ought to double down on doing the things that you have to do to prepare for the next period beyond the immediate, right? You got to double down. And, and for the department, I think that means seeing through all these initiatives to get after retirement reform, health care reform, you know, getting after the infrastructure, proposing a BRAC. Um, you know, industry pulled a lot of levers in these last five years. One of them was footprint. I mean, for our own company, we, we reduced our footprint 20 to 25 percent over a period of about two or three years. We reduced the headcount on the product side because the, the, the demand throughput just wasn't there about 10 to 15 percent or so. Um, you haven't seen those kind of reductions in government, right? You know, and everybody argues to keep the end strength and keep the structure, all for legitimate reasons. But saying BRAC is too, too tough, we can't get after it. If you don't get after it, you're never going to be able to address the bow wave that's coming, and you're never going to be able to protect the investment accounts. And that's just within the DOD. And then, you know, zoom up to the, the national macroeconomic level. Unless the Congress gets after all the elements of taxes and entitlement programs and spending, you know, and all those dimensions, you can't ever get to a solution that makes any sense at a national level. And one of the charts Mike showed the other day uh, here was that by 2030, all of the discretionary spending is no longer covered by the amount of revenues coming in because of the growth in entitlements, because of the growth in interest. We've been, you know, in a very benign period with respect to interest rates on the debt. Think about now the accumulated debt with higher interest rates. You know, once that starts to go up, think about 1981 and what, what the picture looked like, you know, in the early years of the Reagan administration, right? I mean, you got to address the macroeconomic issues, both at a national level and in the department. You know, now is not the time to say, hey, we're good, job's done. You know, they got to double down on what they're doing. Yeah, if I could just add to that. Uh, so a key potential uh, reform that the Congress is going to be looking at, and I think the Chairman uh, Thornberry uh, Christian raised it a couple weeks ago, is the uh, return to looking at the health care reforms within the DOD budget. Uh, I certainly grappled with it, even during uh, very uh, robust periods of funding uh, under, under my tenure. Um, it was one of the concerns that I had and continue to have, and I think if the Congress is willing to take a look at it, the Compensation and Reform uh, Commission uh, provided a nice pathway uh, to potentially dealing with that in a fair way that would allow quality outcomes for military families. So uh, again, I don't know how far they'll go, um, but they have indicated that they're going to take it up. Uh, it could provide a nice uh, potential uh, relief. And to Dave's point, uh, in industry or in any other organization, when your growth is uh, leveling off, you've got to look at your, not to, obviously not your, just your top line, but your bottom line and what can you do. And I think what Dave has indicated is that industry has taken 
um, it taken taken the handle to that and uh, it pulled that handle lever, that lever and reduced their footprint, reduced their infrastructure to increase their uh, operating uh, earnings. Those are critical things, but at a certain point, they don't have any more levers to pull. And so, so I, th so I think it is a valid criticism or a valid point to emphasize uh, when the Congress looks forward. Uh, what are they going to do on some of the major cost drivers in the department? It's not just, you know, the acquisition reform legislation is very important, making use of non-traditional and commercial um, uh, tools to take advantage of non-traditional and, and commercial uh, acquisition are, are critical, but the department also has to embrace that legislation. They have to say, yep, we like it, we're going to use it. Uh, Dave and I were both present uh, when we had to deal with the MRAPs, uh, which was not exactly economical. <laughs> uh, but it was certainly a way to rapidly acquire a needed capability. And I think, um, again, the, the Congress hopefully will take up a very important uh, another leg of this that would provide some relief for the investment accounts. I would just got to add one thing. In health care reform, if, if you just if you look at the numbers on that, of course, the exact savings depend on what kind of reform uh, you use. But even relatively modest changes in the military health care system that actually still provide good quality outcomes for military families, um, that could easily pay for something like JSTARS. You know, I mean, we're talking military health care is 10 percent of the DOD budget. Uh, and that's not including veterans health care, which is outside of DOD's budget and is even larger than DOD's health care expenses. But any slight changes in the military health care system can have huge budgetary impacts. So I think the the, the uh, reform commission's estimate were about was about I believe twenty five billion. I think oh, yeah, over the over the over fight the, up. Yeah, yeah. over a right. multi year period. So we have uh, quite a collection of experience here of budgeting and programming, uh, and so I, I had two more questions. I'm going to combine them in the interest of time and to get to audience questions as, as quickly as possible. So. Uh, so how does it make sense to plan in, in an environment where, uh, theoretically, under the statutes, uh, you know, again, it may not happen, but under the statutes, the investment accounts were projected probably to go back down from where they are going to be in FY16. Uh, we probably think that's not going to happen, right? No, no single year in which the Budget Control Act has been in existence have we actually budgeted to that level. Every year it's been either modestly higher or slightly more modestly higher. Um, uh, and so it's reasonable probably not to plan that we're going to go to the BCA sequester levels, um, but, it's, uh, but it is hard to plan. And so how does it make sense then for the department to think about investing in weapon systems? I know when sequestration first hit, one of the big questions the department received is why didn't you cancel any major weapons programs? And the answer essentially was they don't get you any money in the first year, so what's the point? Uh, uh, but that's not true over time, right? I mean, in three and four years, you can get big money by canceling an entire weapon system program. Um, but we haven't seen that. So the question then is, how does it make sense to plan in this environment? And then just let me wrap on to that. Um, we're at a moment where we're trying to engage in a third offset strategy, where there's actually a strategic objective to, to make some bets, some medium to big bets on technology in support of the strategy. Uh, and so how do you plan that into your planning factor? Um, I'd be happy to, to start. Um, you got to make tough choices, I guess is the way that I would say it. Um, one of the interesting things about the BCA caps and, and having sort of lived it on both sides, industry very rapidly adapted to the BCA caps as the driving force in their planning you know, for what they thought their companies could do over the course of the next couple of years. Then, you know, mercifully, if it's higher, you got a little bit of upside. On the other hand, uh, the DOD has always assumed the best and, you know, prepared budgets that sort of ignored the DOD or, or the BCA caps and said, we're, we think we're going to do better. And they did slightly better, but closer to the caps than to the Gates numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and then were constantly disappointed when, you know, the, the full figures weren't achieved. I don't think you can plan on the best case. You got to plan on a reasonable case, and then you got to make tough decisions about what programs live and what programs die uh, in that scenario. And and you got to get after these other elements of the budget, you know, O and M costs and personnel costs that are going to swamp 
uh, the investment accounts unless you do something to change the course of where you're going. That requires some tough decisions, and that's sort of what I'm saying about, you know, now that we have a budget deal and hopefully have an omnibus, you got to make some of these tough things, you know, come to reality. You can't just say two more years of little salami slices on the margin and we're keeping all the programs alive because you hit the bow wave and then, and then they're going to die anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the department is uh, at least, you know, you, uh, you, told, you had a chart a couple weeks ago uh, and mentioned it this morning, Todd, that the department has planned and sent up budgets and then uh, been disappointed. And to a certain extent, uh, I'm not going to say that that's uh, less than what they needed. However, it's a bit of gamesmanship when you consider what the reality is uh, on a floor. So, um, you know, industry cannot afford to be wrong with its shareholders. So they have got to be, uh, they cannot make the types of mistakes uh, that Dave just indicated where they're uh, projecting earnings at a certain level and then missing those earnings. They are, the CEO no longer has a job if that's the case. So uh, the department needs to be realistic about its go forward. It is always easier to add and find program than it is to take program out. Um, and we, I've been through a couple cycles where we were able to do this. When I first went into the Department of Defense, we had a supplemental request and a supplemental budget that went up and it was pretty easy to add money uh, and program it. Uh, that can happen like that. But to uh, appropriately uh, uh, Re revamp uh, the program um, with major weapon systems in a quick period of time, that is very painful. It is very costly and uh, unwise. So, so I'm not sure, none of us are sure what's going to happen in the next two years in terms of uh, transitioning to a new administration. But obviously there are options that they have. One is to stick with the caps and uh, the deal that's on the table, and one is to, uh, to take a look at it and suggest that they're going to carve out other areas of the federal budget to try to increase or to increase taxes. So all tough choices, but I uh, absolutely affirm Dave's point of view that you have to have uh, realism in your planning and that if you, you know, stick your head in the sand, you're going to be a lot worse off uh, than you are that, uh, by properly planning. You know, I, I would just add that this is obviously much easier said than done. Um, but I think what the department's got to try to do as best as it can is maintain programmatic agility. And by that, I mean the ability uh, to shift the schedules of programs dynamically on the fly uh, as you go. Uh, and that is not healthy for programs in the long run. It will likely end up costing us more in the long run. Um, but if we're going to be able to get through this period of budget instability, I think it's going to be inevitable. Um, you, you don't want to have to kill big programs. Uh, it would be better if you could uh, to slip schedules. And so try not to get locked in the contracts that lock you into a certain schedule whenever that's possible. It's not always possible, though. Um, but, it, you know, the, the dilemma here is if you actually plan for the worst case for the budget cap level, you make it a little more likely that that'll happen um, because then people see it and they say, oh, okay, well, you've got a reasonable plan there. You know, you made some tough choices, but I can live with that. Um, you know, so the incentive is to plan for what you think you really need or, you know, the upper limit of what you think you could get. Um, but then you face the problem of, well, it's not realistic and you're not going to be able to get all of that, so you've got to have a, a good backup plan. Uh, the backup plan you want to show people is the one that's, you know, the Washington Monument strategy of everything's going to fall apart and you're going to hate this. Uh, but you've got to have a realistic backup plan, too, of, okay, the cut happened. What am I going to slip? What am I going to defer? And it's a real dilemma on how much do you plan and how much do you show. I, on, on the, you know, we've all heard the Washington Monument strategy. I think credibility is really important. Um, and I've certainly found in the course of uh, my career, if you have frank conversations, and certainly the, uh, the general officers, the flag officers, uh, Dave knows this firsthand, uh, when they are asked and in dialogue with uh, members of Congress and with their leadership in the department, 
have a duty to tell tell their leadership uh, and stakeholders what their actual what their true requirements are uh, to deliver certain capability and to deliver certain outcomes with with probabilities. Um, the whole unfunded requirements list came about uh, because uh, the line needed to be drawn uh, because of budget realities, but it did not mean that there were other things that were not um, important or, pri or potential priorities. So I think uh, your point is taken, uh, but I do think that credibility and being able to speak uh, truthfully about the needs and then engage with the stakeholders in potential options and solutions is very important in the no, no matter what, what you're facing going forward. Well, thank you very much. And at this point, we've got about half an hour left. I want to open up to our audience for questions and see uh, we've got a distinguished group here. So why don't we? Hi, Rob Levinson, Bloomberg Government. Um, Dave, you mentioned, and the way I've characterized this is, you know, solving the defense budget problems are really a dependent variable on the larger discussion about taxes, entitlements. Todd alluded to the problem with entitlements. Right now, we have a presidential campaign, and there seems to be an inverse relationship between, among candidates, of the size of the increase of the defense budget you want and the and the uh, amount of money that you are going to deprive the government of through tax cuts. And you know, at what point? Is it incumbent upon us who care about national defense and care about the defense budget to say, you know, maybe now if you want the increase in the military spending is not the time for massive decreases in government revenue? Um, you know, well, I think, first of all, things that get said on a campaign, you know, may or may not be based in, in realities as you've described them. <laughs> Um, right. I mean, you know, campaigning is about trying to win, uh, you know, support and votes. Uh, and, and I think more votes and support are won by talking about the things we're going to do for you than the things we're going to do to you. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I, ho I wish there was a little bit more of a dialogue, you know, on the campaign circuit about national security, you know, and about what's happening around the world and how would people take approaches to try and, and solve some of those problems. Um, and, then, and then the next conversation, and how would you go about, you know, structuring government and all the revenues and tax uh, structure that we have to try and be able to pay for the things that you think you need. Um, haven't had that dialogue yet, uh, but we ought to uh, at some point in this continuum between now and uh, next November. Um, you know, with respect to defense, there's always a question about how much defense is enough, right? And, and each of the, the service chief, the Joint Chiefs and uh, the Secretary of Defense have a view about that. Uh, clearly their view is that we need some more capability and some more resources and funding and a greater uh, share of national treasure to be able to handle the things that we think are important to us. Um, and you know, that could change overnight. Uh, in, in the days before 9-1-1, uh, the Army was shedding divisions, the Air Force was shedding wings, and the Navy was shedding ships. In the day after 9-1-1, everybody was trying to figure out how to spend more money to counter, you know, this new threat that hadn't been conceived of in that, in that scale before. Uh, so, you know, I think you, you want to keep a reasonable set of capabilities, which I believe personally is higher than where we are today, uh, but you got to get after it by solving some of the national level issues, what seem to be the intractable issues. But that's, you know, when you all pull a lever or I pull a lever to go, you know, vote for somebody that we want to send to Congress or the Senate, we do so with an expectation that they're going to fulfill the responsibilities of what legislators are supposed to do. Solve problems, figure out how to not, not even balance the budget, but, but come up with a reasonable budget and to have a tax structure uh, that supports it and an entitlement system that is as fair as you can make it. Those tough decisions aren't being undertaken. They just aren't. Uh, the grand bargain notion, maybe we thought we were close, we weren't close enough, and all these other things that we're doing near term are more Band-Aid-like than they are uh, real solutions to those problems. Let me just add, add one thing, and this is maybe out of character for a, a think tanker, but uh, something that just continues to amaze me and that I can't get my mind around is how we're unwilling to make changes that are relatively small and uh, I don't have a list of favorites, but there are some that have been out there. We talked about chain CPI, relatively modest changes in defense health care that could 
generate big savings, and yet we are willing to tolerate things that are really huge. And I think the standing down of entire air wings, which happened across uh, the services during the, the worst part of sequestration, and it just sort of, to me, went by un remarkably uncommented upon. And so there's this real mismatch of outrage about somewhat small changes uh, in, in big programs versus hugely, I would use the word, I know Secretary Panetta used it and people now laugh a little bit, but catastrophic, you know, the stand down of those, of those air wings was really catastrophic from a national security perspective. We were lucky that we didn't get, uh, didn't pay a, bit, a larger price for that than we did, but it's actually a very long-term price because it has readiness implications for many years after we did that. Uh, and it just sort of uh, it just sort of passed notice. So and that was a little bit more of a <laughs> of a speech than I meant to do. Let me uh, come to the question here. Thank you, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Uh, the other day, Mike McCord said that um, some modernization programs will be slowed down to account for this roughly $15 billion gap, um, but he didn't say which specific programs would be hit, and he kind of dodged Todd's question about whether the F-35 uh, would fall victim. So I was wondering, you know, what uh, major programs do you think we can expect to be slowed down in FY17, and then what is the long-term ripple effect of that? Can these programs catch up, or does that push the schedule to the right pretty much permanently? Thank you. Yeah, I would say the one thing he did indicate was LRSB, but that slowdown really is just, you know, because there was a delay in the contract award. So we've known that that program was going to slip because of that. Uh, and that does take a, a substantial amount of money uh, out of the fight up, uh, but it just pushes it into that bow wave just outside the fight up. Um, but, you know, and other programs, I think for the most part, when you slip it, you're not going to be able to make it up. Um, you know, that there are, there are cases where you can add more money and more resources, but you can't add more time. And so when we slip things, they're just going to slip. I don't anticipate that we'll be making them up. Yeah, I mean, I just would agree. And I think the, uh, in the Authorization Act, they already took the, uh, the savings off of the contract uh, slip for, uh, the, for the bomber. Um, as part of their the as, FY16 as, yeah, savings, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> that's going to continue. Obviously, I mean, you know, the big programs, the MDAPs are. You, you have to take a look at how they're performing, uh, in alignment of uh, the reality with where the contract is coming. Uh, you know, coming in, just like with the bomber. Um, those are. You just have to look at those. Those are the ones that are going to be uh, first and foremost on the uh, programmers and budget or budgeteers' uh, minds. Great. Hi, thanks. Justin Johnson with the Heritage Foundation. Thanks for the great panel. Uh, just to follow up on the health care discussion a little bit, do you think the DOD in their budget submission will actually propose a significant health care reform like the commission endorsed or return to their kind of small ball, you know, $5 copay increases? Uh, enrollment fee increase type things. Did you have a view, Todd? Well, you know, I would say that if the, the past is in the indicator of the future, um, you know, for the most part, I think the department has chosen to, pardon the phrase, lead from behind uh, on a lot of personnel and compensation issues. Uh, and they have, you know, been stuck in the rut of proposing the same kind of things again and again that keep getting rejected by Congress, uh, hoping that something will magically change. So my bet would be uh, that they propose, you know, a similar thing like they did last year, some pharmacy tweaks, some copay increases, something like that. Nothing as revolutionary uh, as the Compensation Commission proposed of, you know, putting people, uh, family members in particular, uh, in a, a new system where they have a, a voucher, a house, uh, health care allowance. Uh, I, I don't see the department getting behind that. I mean, they only just recently, after it was enacted into law, uh, you know, put out the force of the future statement that said that they would actually implement the retirement reform that had just passed Congress. Um, you know, they opposed it initially or refused to support it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that Congress is going to have to lead on health care reform. I wouldn't anticipate to get that from the department. Yeah, I would... I would agree with that. It's very painful um, internally to kind of propose these major reforms 
and I think a key proponent, the key proponents of these reforms uh, are on Capitol Hill at the moment. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see. I don't know whether they'll, how much they'll bite off. Um, but uh, we saw what they were willing to do, the conversation that happened around acquisition reform and what actually came out of the legislation, whether you end up this year uh, at the end of the legislative cycle with a completely new uh, proposal, such as the one uh, for a basic allowance for health care, as was proposed by the commission, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that in the, in the larger conversation of what do we do on priorities, there are only certain places you can go for the types of savings. BRAC was mentioned, some type of reform in personnel. We had the, um, uh, we, we've all seen what they did as with the, uh, on the retirement piece of it, which I think is a good, a good move, but the major movers, uh, healthcare is one of the key ones that's left out there. So I'm not sure I would make a prediction on the end of the legislative cycle where you are, but they have signaled their intent to take up the issue. And I would just say that, you know, we started off this whole conversation talking about predictability. There obviously has to be predictability for, you know, the millions of men and women, you know, who have served uh, and, and are part of this whole uh, health care system and retirement system. Um, and, and as long as you can give people a sort of a path to where you're going and explain what you're doing and why you're doing it and <clears throat> give people time to adjust and make alternative plans over time, I think you can get there. Um, you know, if there's any companies represented here, how many of those companies have made changes to their health care programs, their pensions, and other things, but they were done compassionately, they were done with an explanation, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of coaching and counseling of what are we going to do to make this an acceptable thing for you someplace off in the future. I think that has to happen here as well, but you got to get started. I would add one thing is that, you know, we've got to keep in mind here along those lines that, you know, things like health care reform and other types of compensation reform, it shouldn't just be about the money, right? It should be about getting better value for what we are spending on compensation. You know, we want to make sure that we're giving people a health care benefit that is as good or better uh, and give them choice and flexibility. Uh, and as the Compensation Commission showed, that there are ways of doing that uh, that haven't been explored uh, in a lot of detail. So uh, that really ought to be the focus, is about getting better value out of our military health care dollars. And if you can get some savings in the process, great. Byron? Sure. Uh, Byron Cowan, Capital Alpha Partners. Two questions. Why first do you think it's so difficult to divest of these older weapon systems? We still don't fly A4s or uh, F4s or uh, M60s these days. Why is it so difficult on things like the KC-10 or the A10 uh, to have this dialogue with Congress? That's one. And David, can you talk a little bit about the acquisition workforce in the DOD and where they are in their training and understanding? Because there are things like commercial pricing or performance-based logistics where there really are some some win-wins on both sides. but what, from an industry standpoint, would you like to see uh, the acquisition workforce better trained at? Uh, okay, I'll start with the second one. And, um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the intent and the direction that you hear from the top of the house uh, is, is sort of headed in the right direction about what we need to try and streamline. Uh, that's not 100% not true, but, but for the most part, I think it's true. The problem is, is that you have a workforce that has been trained and rewarded and incentivized over time to do things and think about things in a slightly different way, right? And, and it's a very risk-averse workforce. Um, you know, that uh, if, if promotion, you know, for the uniform folks is, is the mechanism to describe success, you got a bad program or, you know, you've let something fail and maybe that doesn't happen. Same for the civilian employees. So I think part of it is getting a little bit over the risk aversion uh, that, that's out there. Uh, part of it was, uh, you know, when the pendulum swung to the right on uh, LPTA contracts, it really swung to the right. And everybody said that this is the new mantra and, you know, must do, you know, robotically. Well, now we're trying to, you know, bring the pendulum back because we realized that we weren't getting the value, the best value that maybe we wanted in all circumstances. So that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It also takes the leadership, you know, making sure that they're engaged and talking to and helping people understand what the intent really is. So um, 
I don't think it's an impossible task. I, you know, I feel very confident that, that some things are moving in the right direction. Some of it's going to be help from Congress, right? Congress is saying, you're going a little too slow. We want to give the service chiefs a, a, a more prominent role. The truth is they always had a prominent role. Uh, you know, that's not exactly something, you know, really new or revolutionary. It's just a revalidation of a role that already sort of existed. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's going to take time, but I think it's moving in the right direction. Okay, there's a question on the back. Oh, you, your other question? Oh, yeah, well, well, in part, um, it's because we, we, DOD, uniformed people and others, have done such a good job of explaining why these are great systems, right? Um, it takes a long time to enfranchise, you know, not only the DOD. I spent a lot of hours trying to convince Tina of things uh, as an Army person. Um, but it takes a long time to convince uh, the Congress uh, that these are good things and they ought to be funded, you know, in the annual appropriation cycles. And then when you get to, you know, near the end of a life of one of these systems, there are constituencies, many of them, that will argue why this is, you know, this is a great system. If we just plow some more money into it and upgrade it, we can make it, you know, even, even better. That, that was, those are the tough calls that the department has to make. I think usually when the department finally pulls a plug on, some, on something, you know, uh, for example, like C-17, which, you know, was prolonged for a while, the department has come to the conclusion that we, we've got enough, you know, it's, it's time to move on to the next thing. Um, but it's sticky, and so, you know, it tends to live on for a few more years in Congress before people finally realize that, hey, it's done. And they just closed the C-17 factory, right? Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, on that point, uh, there is also the fear of the department moving to new systems, right? Are they going to be as reliable as they, you know, are they going to be there for us? And, uh, and I think the F-35 is an interesting example. Um, there, any new development program, hey, we know the planes we have work, just keep letting us fly them, give us the amount of money that we need to fly them, uh, keep them in good shape. Uh, but when you're moving to a new, when you're moving to a new system, there's always a question mark. And, um, but I would agree completely with uh, Dave with respect to constituencies as well. They, some of these platforms do have constituencies. Question in the back. Sharon Pickup, former GAO. Um, I remember uh, sitting in the Army conference room uh, way when Army modularity started, and, and Dave, you briefing us on uh, the Army's holes in the yard mm. briefing slide, and uh, to me, which of course demonstrated the gap between wants, needs, and affordability. So I'm curious about your comment about um, uh, cl better collaboration between industry and the department, including the synchronization of R&D plans. And I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and any other's perspective up there is how do you think that that could help address this fiscal situation that we find ourselves in? Well, you know, from, from a, an industry perspective, uh, when it comes to investing dollars in R&D, you really don't want it to just be a dartboard that's at the other end of the room and you're throwing and maybe you hit something, you know, and, and maybe you don't. Uh, you want to have uh, a better and a more meaningful dialogue with the government folks who establish the requirements about what do we really need going forward? You know, what's our roadmap for the future? Where do we need investment? What technologies are important to us? And industry will take its cue from that. The problem over at least the last several years has been uh, that, um, you know, everybody's getting lawyered up. Uh, and those kind of dialogues that maybe used to occur more frequently are not occurring uh, in the same way anymore. And so then it becomes the dartboard at the other end of the room, which I think is in part why industry sort of retrenched a bit over the last couple of years and started to redu reduce some of the investment dollars because they didn't have a good, clear picture about where the department wants to go. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the notion that we would just bring IRAD in and have it approved by somebody in the Pentagon, which was sort of a recent thing that then was rolled back, isn't the answer either. It's, it's a better dialogue between those PEOs and PMs and industry uh, and a little less lawyering up, you know, to allow those conversations to occur without deeming them, you know, inappropriate. Um, that's one thing. And then more, you know, quick flash to bang kinds of things that, that allow for pretty quick testing of things that have pretty high technology levels, uh, you know, and then leading to procurement. The Army tried this with the network integration evaluation stuff out in White Sands. What got in the way of that was the testing community who said, well, hey, not so fast. 
um, you know, we, we don't think that these things have been tested adequately enough and you know, for you to start buying them. What that resulted in was industry did make a significant investment in some of those things and then saw no payback and said, well, this isn't working. So the better dialogue and the better mechanisms, you know, to bring things, you know, from demonstration to production, I think would go a long way. Well, I think, uh, Dave, you just walked us into a great issue that Todd uh, raised, a, a big idea that, uh, that I think we ought to talk a little bit about, which is the issue of structuring programs perhaps in a different way, such that they are uh, quicker flash to bang, as you said, which would be good for industry, that would be good from an innovation perspective, keeping up with the pace of technological change. But also, potentially, Todd raised the idea that if you had programs that are a little more flexible and adjustable, you would be better off in an era of budget uncertainty as well. Uh, and so this idea, uh, which is very much countercultural to the acquisition system, because the acquisition system uh, as currently structured is, is a system in which I decide on day one to snap a chalk line. Mm -hmm. And anything then that happens in the next 30 years that wasn't part of that initial chalk line is a failure, a deviation, a cost growth, a schedule slip, a, uh, a a testing failure of not meeting the KPPs originally set out. It's all, it's all structured then. Deviation from plan is inherently a negative thing in all cases under our, the way our system is structured. Maybe a slight overstatement, but I think it's essentially true. Um, and, and so for, it sounds like for a couple of reasons, we might want to think about structuring programs such that deviation from plan is not a failure. It's not a sign of failure. It's merely a sign of uh, of, of adjusting to reality. So I'd just like to kind of throw that out for a, a little bit of thought. You may have seen that a little bit more. I know that the industry space that you were in was one where technology moves very fast. Right. Uh, uh, and not so much like, you know, sort of the, the old model, if you will, industrial model of tanks and ships. Well, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think what you've seen, uh, at least in the realm of, uh, like, for example, you know, communications and electronics, uh, is that programs that were begun a long time ago either have been modified repeatedly along the way because of changes in technology, or you take a, a stance where you say we're going to buy, you know, a few less things more often, uh, as long as they're compatible, you know, backwards and forwards compatible uh, with other things we might buy in the future. You know, that's a way to get around that problem. I, I think, you know, all the stops and starts in the many communications programs are evidence of the fact that technology ran faster than the program cycle. Uh, you know, I think one way of getting around this uh, is we've got to move away from this platform-centric model of acquisitions, where it's all about buying the big platforms and move more towards a payload-centric model, uh, you know, payload sensors, munitions, and things that what you put on the platforms uh, and the software, of course, it goes in them as well. Uh, that is happening, I think, already, um, just because we're being forced to. That's the way technology is going. I mean, we're still flying B-52s. Uh, but we're hanging different things on them. Right. Uh, and so we've got to, I think we've got to move more. Maybe we can accelerate the transition to more of a, a payload-centric acquisition system. So then you're buying smaller things, and you can buy them more quickly, and you've got to cycle through them more quickly uh, and, and focus on doing that. I think space acquisitions is a good candidate um, for going to more of a payload-centric model. And in some cases, you don't necessarily need to buy a satellite bus at all. You could buy the payload and host it on someone else's satellite. Uh, and so, you know, those are the kind of things that are being looked at now, and maybe we need to transition to that a little faster because that would give us more programmatic agility. Yeah, there's, there's a great example of that in, um, you know, the Arion company's hanging of GPS, uh, you know, devices on their Iridium payloads that were going to go up 66 of them around the world anyway, and now, you, you know, once done, you'll have GPS uh, connectivity across the oceans, which is not the case today. You know, so that's a great example. Um, I mean, the great point here, too, is uh, companies will innovate. Um, we just look at what happened um, was last week um, with Jeff Bezos' um, uh, uh, launch uh, and return. And so companies will innovate if you let them. And so giving them the ability, uh, whether it's their own ability uh, to have to expand their uh, portfolio, take a look at certain uh, technologies and areas of capability that the department is interested in, but hog tying a company to a particular set of specifications and adding on to 
you know, additional regulation or intrusion into that innovation, that can be difficult. Um, I think, you know, we talked about health care earlier. One of the reasons that the federal health uh, uh, program works is that companies are, are able to be innovative in how they provide health uh, to that uh, portfolio of uh, customers. And I think the arguments uh, on the side of a basic allowance for health care would allow companies, instead of being dictated to by a massive uh, 21 or 20 plus billion dollar contract, innovate first and then we'll give our military families some choice. The same is true in other, in other areas. Um, so let the companies innovate and be flexible enough. I don't know whether you, your term was program agility, uh, but let them, let them have enough space to innovate and offer uh, back to the department other solutions and options, potential. And then also rethinking some of the things that we currently buy as products, maybe we should be buying them as services, you know, so instead of buying right. a hospital for the military, maybe we buy healthcare right. services that substitute for that. Instead of buying a communication satellite, maybe we buy communication services. Um, you know, it, you can't do that for everything, but there are a lot of things where we probably could switch from being a, you know, product purchaser to being a service purchaser. We've got time for one more question. Bob Rank from Gulfstream. Todd, I'd like you to pull the string a little bit on your payload-centric uh, acquisition. Uh, we've been doing that with JSTARS. We've been doing that with a lot of the EW platforms. How do you cope with when the airframe hits a wall? Yeah, I mean, you eventually get to a point where you are going to have, you do have to buy platforms. I mean, the bomber is a good example, and I think they really are trying to use more of a payload-centric approach than we have in the past. Um, but, you know, the idea is when you have to buy the platform, when you run up against the wall and, you know, you're either going to have to replace the wings, the engine, the avionics, and, you know, everything else, and then inspect it after every flight, um, you get up to that wall, yeah, you got to buy a new platform, but buy it as a truck. You know, buy it as a, a utility vehicle uh, where the intention is that it will not come with all the bells and whistles. You're going to add those later, uh, and you're going to swap them out frequently over the life of that platform. Uh, and so using, you know, open architectures where you can compete all of those subsystems in the future, um, you know, and, and then also reconsider. I mean, a bomber is an example where you have to buy the platform because there aren't you can't lease bombers or you, know, you can't you know, buy bomber services from anyone. Uh, and if you could, you shouldn't. Um, but, but, you know, there are things like satellites where, you know what, maybe I don't have to buy the satellite. You know, I've got a special payload. Maybe I can't buy that as a service because I need, you know, a specific type of data that no one in the commercial sector is going to provide anyway. Um, so I'll build the payload and then I'll figure out how to get it on a satellite. And I'll do that separately because the satellite is just... Well, it's a satellite bus. <laughs> you know, we got to think of a, think of them that way. Uh, and so, you know, as much as we can, divorce the acquisition of the payloads from the platforms, uh, and keep the platforms pretty simple. Pretty, you know, just the basic truck that you anticipate is gonna, you're gonna, you know, fly it or drive it for a long time, uh, and you're gonna constantly be updating it with new sensors and munitions and things. Well, this has been a great discussion. Uh, just, to, just to briefly summarize or recap, uh, because I thought there were some really great points brought out that in this very challenging time for acquisition and, and budget uncertainty and trying to plan investments at the same time that we're trying to be innovative and modernize uh, with a bow wave out there, that, the, that it's critical that, uh, that we make tough choices, mm -hmm. that it's time to make tough choices. It's critical that the department look for uh, reforms outside the acquisition system to make space for investment, uh, but also critical that it look for reforms inside the acquisition system for, our, for a variety of reasons to be more uh, flexible and adaptable. And uh, it's been a great discussion. Please join me in, in thanking our panelists. Thank you.